Hi, Hi good, good afternoon. afternoon. I'm, I'm Dr. Annette Marcus from St. Clair County, County Health, Health Department. Department. And, and I, I just, just want to do a shout out to Russ Decree for picking that snazzy song. I enjoy it. Every, Every week, week when, when we, we listen, listen, we get, get ready, ready to go. go. Bop Bop around. Around. Thank, Thank you, Ross. Ross. That was, was a great, great pick. pick. All, right, All right, so let's, so let's get, get right, right to our data, data and, then and then we'll, we'll take, take your, your questions. questions. Hey, Doc. Yes. You're really echoey today. Elise, I don't know if you can hear that. Well, nothing new that, on my end. That's better. I don't hear an echo. Okay. So our first uh, slide shows our total number of cumulative cases at uh, over 21,000, uh, a total of 856 hospitalized and 470 deaths with over uh, 19,000 recovered. Uh, again, the cases we know of are the tip of the iceberg. Um, we would estimate uh, for every case known, there's at least a couple more cases out there that are unknown that weren't tested. So then we have our changes in the last seven days. We have uh, 477 new cases, uh, 68 average new cases per day, which is um, it's a pretty heavy load for, for us here at the health department to try and make those contact traces. And then uh, unfortunately five uh, new more uh, new COVID deaths that have been reported. And I'll just take a moment to say uh, our condolences to all of you who have had losses um, either related to death or or injury from COVID. Uh, we know how difficult uh, this has been on everyone. Our case positivity rate's up to 12%. It's kind of hovering. It was hovering at 10%. Now it seems like it's hovering about 12 to 13%. Um, and whether this means a plateau or not, um, it's hard to say. I don't think we're there yet. Are we there yet, Brandon? Now you're taking his head. I don't think we've. So this is what our graph looks like. Um, as you can see on the right, we just have the steady increase. And this is similar to what the rest of the state is seeing, although areas of the state have much higher caseloads and a few are, are doing better. You said the UP was particularly hit right now, right? The UP is struggling. So uh, we'll keep our eyes on that. Next slide. And our immunization rates uh, continue to slowly increase. Uh, we have uh, about three to 350 uh, individuals per week who are still getting their first doses. So keep, keep on coming in, you guys. Keep thinking about it. Um, more and more, the more time goes on, the uh, more information we have on the vaccine that reinforces its value, its safety, and, and uh, its effectiveness. So. Uh, nothing there to dissuade you. Uh, we have close to 55% of the population who's had at least uh, one vaccine. What is our uh, completed rate? It's never on this slide. I gotta remember to write that down. Close to 52%. Yeah, that's right. I always forget that uh, those who've started their vaccine series are tending to complete it, which is good news. So over 50%, but not much more. All right, and the next slide, we included these because of the ongoing debate about schools and school-aged children. Uh, and this is uh, something that is also not unique to St. Clair County, and that is there is a growing proportion of school-age cases. And what you see on the top graph is uh, that red line is the uh, five to 18 year olds, you can see are the highest uh, proportion of cases. Um, and that gap is growing over time. And uh, this uh, second, uh, this is the green lines kind of in the middle are their parents, are the 31 to 50 year olds and then 19 to 30 year olds. And then at the bottom are our elderly. So uh, this goes towards who's vaccinated in our community. And I would say this also go goes towards what different groups are doing to avoid infection. And uh, the bottom graph or the, the color coded um, um, graph on the bottom again shows proportion of age groups with the pink you can see just proportionally is as larger than it was in previous outbreaks. So um, this outbreak looks different than previous outbreaks. And uh, that is something I think that we just have to get used to that it's not same old, same old ho-hum. Uh, this virus is dynamic. It changes and its impact on our community 
is changing as well. Next slide. Uh, just a, a nod to some of the growing data we have on the effectiveness of masks and the importance of using a mask. And um, if we get to, oh, it is the slide. Okay, so we've been able, and this is true again nationally of, of since September anyways, and granted since September is pretty preliminary data, but um, we can clearly see a difference between number of cases in um, situations where masks are used versus not used. And so uh, when there's few mask rules or no mask rules, we'll see significantly greater number of cases versus uh, even partial mask rules. And if, if you notice that uh, they actually have three graphs, one is for a high ma mask, mask index, and that is masks are required for everyone, all grades. And then the medium one is just a partial mask requirement, which is either tiered uh, based on some grades, based on vaccination status, or some cases just staff only. But you'll notice even a partial medium mask um, impact has a significant impact on the number of cases. So uh, more credence to the fact that some mitigation measures are clearly better than none. And the more you put in place, the better we do, which I don't think anyone who uh, reads the literature or understands epidemiology has any questions about at this point even though there's always the naysayers. So we're gonna just go, I have, oh, next slide is, is just our, um, our, just our, our dashboard, which we continue to work on and update. Uh, don't forget that this information is updated regularly for uh, your information. And we also have an important FAQ link where we try and respond to all those questions that people give us um, so that they're in one place so we don't have to respond to them over and over again. All right. So, so we, we did, did not get, get any, any questions, questions, apparently, um, uh, on our, our COVID-19 COVID email, and that's COVID-19 at stclercounty.org. Uh, so, so uh, we, we will answer, answer some, some of the of questions, questions that we got um, at our last couple, couple of meetings, meetings pu public, public meetings, meetings, where, meetings where, where people... Did you, did you have, have a question? question? I'm, I'm a lot of echoing. echoing. Yeah, yeah I'm not, not sure, sure why. why. Well, well, you're, you're echoing, echoing too. too. Mm -hmm. so, so this, this is an IT thing. Why don't you go get Luke? Luke. <laughs> no. no. I'm, I'm not going to fix it. it. So, so I apologize. I apologize. Um, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm talking, talking too loud. loud. I have been, been accused of talking loud. Um, since Can you turn your volume down, down a little, little bit? bit? My, My volume down. down. Hey, okay. how's, how's that? that? Can you hear, you hear me at all? all? Yes, yes the, the same. same. Everybody, Everybody who's commenting, commenting that, that she's, she's echoing, echoing we're aware, aware of that, that. We're, we're working, working on, on it. it. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry about, about that. that. Now, now we can't, we can't hear, hear you at all. all. Can you hear me now? now? Yeah. yeah. But I'm, but still, I'm still echoing, echoing huh? Yes. yes. Uh, Elise, are you on mute? That's the only solution I can possibly come up with. You sound better now. Okay. I didn't do anything, yep. so it's not on my end. I don't think. Maybe Brandon right. was muted. Okay, so let's start with the talking point stock about, um, okay. let's start with the flu vaccine reminder. So we are moving into flu season. As you guys know, most of the time our flu season starts uh, either late October or later. So we want to encourage everybody to get a flu vaccine. Uh, a grave concern is to add. I don't know what's going on. So <laughs> I'm hearing somebody. Elise. Elise, I hear you. We're echoing apparently. Okay, it's better huh? now. Okay. Okay, go ahead. So um, we are concerned about uh, adding a burden of serious influenza cases to our already burdened situation of COVID infections on top of what we normally have is a higher rate burden of 
a lot of things in the fall. I mean, my mom used to always say this is this is viral season. This is pneumonia weather, right? So uh, we usually have a higher burden of infectious diseases in the fall and winter when people go inside. So uh, please uh, get your flu shot. Uh, we'd like to everybody uh, have some protection by the end of October. And um, here at the health department, there is a uh, ample supplies we just ask that you call uh 987-5300 for an appointment so that we don't have a rush all at one time that'd be great though it'd be a great problem to have okay um did i miss okay. anything nope you be when you had started echoing you were talking about we didn't get any questions come through over the evening through our email but these questions that i'm going to ask you are questions that we compiled from the Board of Commissioners meeting um, last week. Okay. So you ready? Yeah. Okay. And then people, um, again, we're sorry for that technical difficulties. Um, but if you have a question, please submit them um, on the live feed. Okay. First question. Can ivermectin or hydrochloroquine cure COVID? We don't think so. But the real answer is we don't know. There is no evidence to support it. Um, the limited studies that have been done on these two drugs are not only very poor quality studies, but they would infer a greater risk than benefit for these uh, medications. And therefore, they are not recommended. Uh, the NIH has recommended against the use of hydrochlor uh, hydroxychloroquine for treatment as well as the ivermectin, uh, which is um, an anti-parasitic uh, 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 drug. So we would recommend that you stay with what we know. We have monoclonal therapy for high-risk individuals. Of course, we have first line would be to prevent the infection in the first place. But if you are going to get infected, we have the monoclonal therapy. Uh, talk to your doctor potentially about other supportive mechanisms, inhalers, uh, the potential use of steroids, although you have to be careful you don't want to use steroids early on in an infectious disease process because it can actually um, encourage a viral replication. Still a lot we don't know there. Antibiotics do not work for viruses. So your z packs and your antibiotics, um, if, you know, your doctor may feel that you might have risk of a secondary infection, but it's not going to help you with COVID or other viral infections. And so we are just very limited very, very limited and what can work once you get infected with COVID. And um, that's why we want you to avoid getting infected in the first place, right? So uh, the answer to um, can ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine cure COVID, uh, it's doubtful. I mean, if it was a cure, I think we'd be all over it. The studies are not very, um, uh, very um, supportive of that. And like I said, we don't have uh, nearly the, the quality of studies to recommend its use. Again, that risk benefit is really important. Medications always have a, a, a negative side to them, and we want to make sure the negative side doesn't outweigh the positive side. Okay. Okay. The next question, um, if a strong immune system, like taking vitamins, eating healthy and exercise, will I, excuse me, if I have a strong immune system and take vitamins, eat healthy and exercise, will I have a less severe case if I get COVID? Well, it's really important that you take care of yourself and we're very happy when people do the things they need to do to stay uh, strong and healthy. But unfortunately, when it comes to infectious agents, uh, being healthy is not a panacea, a guarantee that you're not going to have an infection or a serious infection. Remember, almost 50% of children that are hospitalized with COVID have no comorbidities. And we generally think of our children as, as very healthy and, and having robust immune systems. Um, so it's unclear uh, what actually boosts our immune system. There's genetics involved. There's lifestyles involved. Um, no one has ever said if you take X, Y, and Z, you'll have a healthy immune system. Um, if that were the case, I think we'd be all over it. So I think you just have to use your common sense. You know, you need to eat right. You need to exercise. You need to keep your stress levels down. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> and and you need to not do the things that suppress your immune system. Um, classic things, of course, like that are, are stress, uh, drugs and alcohol, tobacco use, 
um, not getting your rest, not getting an adequate night's sleep. And of course, there's a whole myriad of pharmaceuticals and medications that uh, we are, are inclined to use for serious medical conditions that um, suppress the immune system as well. So sometimes it's unavoidable. So I, I, I love it that you're trying to do the things that are keeping you healthy, but um, no, it does not mean that you are immune to the impacts of, of COVID. I, I wish that were true. Okay. Your best protection. Oh, I got to read your lines. You guys want all this work of writing these down. So. Yeah, that's a, that's thanks to Elise. She thanks, Elise. All that. Your best protection against severe illness from this virus remains the vaccine. I couldn't. That's very true. It's very true. Well said. Okay. The next question was: Is wearing a mask safe for long periods of time? What about breathing back in the carbon dioxide you're breathing out? So masks are safe to wear for long periods of time. Doctors and surgeons and other healthcare providers have been doing this for decades to prevent the spread of infection. Um, and um, I don't know of any physician that is dropped over dead after a long surgery because of mask wearing. Um, masks um, are generally, especially the ones we're recommending for the general public, are relatively loose fitting. So there's lots of ambient air that seeps in and out. So the carbon dioxide levels, even though they may increase a little bit right here, there's plenty of air that comes in and out that would prevent them from a, a dangerous level of carbon dioxide. And, and you guys didn't write this down, but I just want to mention the fact that our bodies are amazingly equipped to accommodate changes in oxygen and CO2 levels because that's our lives, right? We go um, to different altitudes and, 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 and um, oxygen and nitrogen dioxide and all these gas ch um, levels change. So our bodies can accommodate that very, very effectively by changes in our respiratory system, our heart rate, and, and this clearly prevents any buildup of carbon dioxide in our bodies which is what's important for our, this health issue. So even if we are inhaling a little bit higher level of carbon dioxide here, it doesn't change our carbon dioxide levels in our bloodstream, nor does it change our oxygen levels in our bloodstream. So um, rest assured that wearing a mask has never been associated in any of the literature I've read of any serious health conditions. And I know people argue with me, but it's true. Now, I couldn't say if you wear dirty masks and you can get a dermatitis around your face. So don't wear a dirty mask, right? Change it on a regular basis. Okay. And the last question before we move on to the live questions where I heard that there are a lot of false positive rapid, rapid COVID-19 tests. Is that true? No, um, specifically the specificity of antigen. Remember, we have two different kinds of tests. We have antigen tests and PCR tests. Um, both tests um, can have false positive and false negative results. But by far, the danger is having a false negative test. If you're going to have an inaccurate test, it is in the false negative range, especially when there's so many um so much community transmission. So um, false positive tests are really unlikely at this time, especially with a lot of um, transmission, especially if, and of course, we're assuming that you're following the manufacturer's instructions. Actually, if you do the test incorrectly, you're probably going to get a, gonna get a false negative test. So um, let's see, what else do you say? Well, I think that's all you said. Yeah, you got it covered. It. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. So we have a lot of questions that have come through on the live feed, so we'll get started on those. And here we go. The first is from Sue. She asks, is the vaccine that is FDA approved the one being given today? Well, we have three vaccines that have been authorized. We have the Pfizer, Moderna, and the J&J &J vaccine. The Pfizer vaccine has been FDA approved for 16 and older. And the others are in the pipeline. So we are using all three vaccines, but the Pfizer is the one that has received the FDA approval for 16 and older. And booster, I believe. Did they get a booster approval too? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Pfizer did, yes. Yes. Okay, for the, the next question, right. for the booster, yep. 
Okay, the next is from Kevin. He said, I came down with COVID in March and, and also was diagno diagnosed with GBS. Should I take a COVID right. shot? Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, Guillain-Barre syndrome is one that's associated with J and J, although it's a very low, I should put low risk association. The elevation of Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, was only detected after millions of doses were given. And I believe that it was an increase of two or three per million. So it was a very small signal on Guillain-Barre with just the J&J. &J. So with that, they are recommending all vaccines, even with the history of Guillain-Barre, you might want to consider an mRNA vaccine. We do want people who've been already um, diagnosed with COVID and have recovered to get vaccinated because uh, the vaccine response, immune response, is much more vigorous and reliable than our immune response from natural infection. Um, literature and our studies on natural infection do suggest a natural immunity, but it's extremely variable from individual to individual and over time. So we just don't really know how to really tell one person whether or not they have strong coverage or not. The, the best way is to, to get vaccinated. So I would, I might suggest maybe leaning towards the mRNA vaccine. And uh, you can also, of course, uh, talk this over with your doctor. There's uh, great information on these risks uh, associated with the vaccine on the CDC website as well. All right. The next question is from Mary. She says, she asks, can you use monotherapy if you are vaccinated? Yes. So your vaccination status has no bearing on how you can, what you can receive for treatment. So it has, if you got vaccinated last week and had the unfortunate occasion of, re of receiving or getting infected several days later, um, you will um, still be benefit potentially from the monoclonal antibody therapy and, and any other therapy that um, your physicians uh, deem necessary. So now whether that'll have an impact on your effectiveness of the vaccine, that's a different question, but one that we really haven't answered yet. So um, stay tuned. We'll probably know more about that down the line. But if, if you are sick from COVID, regardless of your vaccination status, uh, you are eligible to receive all the same treatments. All right. The next question is from Wendy. She asks, could they have altered the third booster to be better effective against the Delta? They could have. They didn't. Um, the, 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 the current thinking and consensus is that this, these vaccines that are currently available are still very effective against Delta and that there has been no adjustment of that, the makeup of these vaccines to my knowledge as of yet, not to say that they're not in the labs kind of looking at that, but currently our vaccines, including the boosters are the same formulations as what was out prior to Delta. All right. The next question comes from Beth. She asks, are people getting their second COVID vaccine? A couple news agencies have reported hesitancy in getting the second dose. Is this an issue in St. Clair County? Well, we just looked at that when I reported earlier on our, our vaccine status. I believe there's only a what 2% difference in those who received their first dose and don't have a completed series. Oh, it's closer to 4%. But I think St. Clair County is doing pretty good with that overall. Um, I mean, obviously we want everybody to complete their series, but uh, for the most part, I think um, people are following through with it. I mean, if you're gonna get vaccinated, which we want you to, do it right. Just just go for it, get it done. All right, the get next question. Go ahead. Um, comes from Julia. She asks, what percentage of unvaccinated make up the positive COVID-19 cases and the current hospitalized? Ninety percent of our hospitalized cases are unvaccinated. Ninety percent of cases are okay. So ninety percent of our cases are unvaccinated, and eighty-five percent of our hospitalizations are unvaccinated. All right. So Thank the corollary would be true of how many are vaccinated. So ten percent of our cases are vaccinated, and uh, fifteen percent of our hospitalized patients are vaccinated. And what still holds true is if you are, in fact, uh, vaccinated, you still have a 1% risk of becoming a case 
and an even lower risk of being hospitalized. So um, our vaccines are holding up to be pretty effective and, and pretty protective. And that was another question for Mary. She said, got to ask how many are also vaccinated to see the clear picture. Yep. And you just went over that. So, so I'm assuming we got 100% of a case, you know, so 85 unvaccinated, 15% vaccinated. All right. The next question comes from Penny. She said, sorry, I came in late. When are we able to get the Moderna booster? I think I heard it's okay as of today for 65 and older and high risk. They're talking about it today. In fact, I bet you the meeting is just wrapping up now. Um, and I believe that uh, was a discussion about Moderna booster as well as mix and matching the boosters um, for um, maybe a J, the J&J. &J. That I... You're ahead of me, girl. I, I did not have time to listen to the live streaming. We'll, we'll have some information tomorrow. And regardless of what they recommended, it still has to go. This is the VRPAC meeting. So uh, that's the Vaccine uh, Advisory Council for the FDA. It still has to go in front of the ACIP, which is the independent expert panel that reviews and recommends um, these um, usages. And then it goes to back to the FDA for uh, the CDC for their final approval. And then they publish the recommendations in an MMWR. Once it's published is when we give it to you. Okay. So we need to let it go through these channels so that those who understand all of this and is a complex science with complex data, um, we will um, rely on them to sort that out and then provide you uh, the information when it's available. So don't rush to your doctor tomorrow to get your booster shot from Moderna. It's, you're a little quick on the draw either, but as soon as we know, we'll let you know. Pam asks, how many beds are set aside for COVID patients in our county hospitals? I don't believe they set aside any hospital uh, beds. I think they just accommodate what they have. So back in the first surge, they actually had to move uh, patients where all COVID patients were in one unit because of uh, the PPE requirements, that's the, the masking and the personal protective equipment. Remember, there was a shortage. There was concerns of them running out. Situation has altered. The second wave changed that a little bit. And I believe now they're just kind of accommodating COVID patients uh, with the appropriate uh, respiratory, um, what am I trying to think of? Um, protection, the respiratory protection, uh, wherever they need to be. So if, if you have COVID and you happen to be a cardiac patient and you are having cardiac symptoms, you're going to be on a cardiac floor. Um, if you are a COVID patient and you need to be, be on a ventilator, you're going to go to the ICU. So I, if you're a pediatric patient, you're going to be in the pediatric ward. So I, I think that's how our hospitals are handling it. And, um, I'll let you know if I'm wrong, because I might hear from them if they say, no, no. I don't think any of them, though, have a special board right now. I think they're they're just using all their resources uh, as best as they can. All right. Julia asks, what would, excuse me, would you suggest not gathering for the holidays? Those are such difficult questions, and I can't answer that for anybody. Um, I think it depends on a number of factors. Um, the makeup of your family. Um, is your family vaccinated or unvaccinated? Um, are there high-risk individuals in that family? Do you have transplant patients or particularly vulnerable individuals that if they were exposed and infected, they'd have a high risk? Um, is your family huge? Are they all be like shoved into a little tiny area for hours and hours? Or um, do, you, do you have the ability to, um, to have smaller, smaller gatherings? I, I think it really depends on, and, and what and bottom line is, what's your comfort level? So in my family, we have a couple individuals who are, are really, really nervous about this. And we have others that um, are willing to compromise. And um, I'm fortunate, uh, we have a mostly vaccinated family. So that makes a decision, I think, a, a little easier. But there still may be individuals who aren't going to feel comfortable uh, getting together. So um, I think your family has to sit down and discuss this and say, and, and by December, oh my God, I'm really hoping maybe we'll have seen uh, like a plateau and a decline. 
we'll know more in the next few weeks, right? I, I wish I could predict that. So have a plan A and a plan B. That would be my suggestion. <laughs> All right, the next question actually is asked by Pam and then Sue. Um, it's kind of a continuation of another question. But the Pfizer is approved under the name Cormorinity, excuse me if I said that wrong, and is not being distributed in the U.S. So the shots that are being given out are emergency use only. Oh, Pam, I don't know where you got that information. I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of that at all. I don't believe that's correct. Uh, so maybe you could share that link or wherever you're getting that information from. So the FDA approval is is kind of a licensing thing. And so when you license a drug, you have to name it. It is the same Pfizer vaccine as what we've been using all along. It's the same dosage, same formulation, same manufacturer. It just has a trade name now associated with it. And uh, so um, I'm not familiar that it's not being distributed. I, please let me know where you get that information from. And I think, Doc, it just goes back to this, and you've covered it most weeks, is the whole um, people's confusion with the emergency use authorization. Yeah. The process uh, that was sped up so that the benefit of the vaccine could be available in our community. Remember, if they did not use an emergency use authorization process, we still wouldn't have vaccine. Uh, we'd be looking, this surge would be a whole lot different looking than it is if we hadn't rolled those vaccines out in January. So it's a win for our country to have this process in place. And in no way does it impact the product, um, the safety or the effectiveness of the product. Okay, the next question is from Kelly. She asks, what are the average number of cases seen in local schools? Mm, average number of cases in local schools. Well, it varies a lot from school to school. I can tell you that. And I think a lot of that has to do with testing strategies and um, situations in the schools. Um, I can tell you, oh, I don't have the, the outbreaks. But, and the other thing I got to remind you to, so schools with higher populations, so our schools that have lots and lots of students are going to have more cases, right? Just proportionally. Um, so we do have a lot of cases in, in the Port Huron schools and the East China schools, Elgin schools. But I'm going to let Brandon work through that question and we'll come back to it, see if I can give you something a little bit more definitive than that. Can you do that, Brandon? He's looking it up now. All right, next okay. question. Um, it's 402. Do you want to keep going? Oh, sure. For 15 minutes. Okay, we'll end today at 415. Uh, the next question is from Linda. If you get a COVID, excuse me, if you get COVID a second time, can you still get the monoclonal antibodies? If you get COVID the second, yeah, I don't believe there's any limitation to how many times you can get a treatment. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to make a jump that the first time you had COVID, you got mono, monoclonal antibodies and recovered. And if you're getting COVID a second time, could you get the same treatment? Yes, you could. Okay. The next question is from Tracy. She says, she asks, please share information about home COVID tests. Where can you get them? Are they being accepted? So I believe home COVID tests are antigen tests, by the way. And I believe that you can buy them at most of your pharmacies, but I also understand that they're a little hard to come by, that they're not quite as accessible as they were at the beginning. Um, and if you follow the manufacturer's instructions carefully, the results are pretty, it's like a pregnancy test, right? It's like, you know, one, one line and I don't, haven't done one, so I don't know if it's a line or a color would indicate a positive versus a negative. They are being accepted, but we ask that you take a photo shot of it or, or put it into, and some of these uh, give you an app that you can actually enter the data into, but you, you, you want to have that result available in something concrete, in my opinion. Um, and then you let us know and we'll go through it. So uh, we are accepting them. I believe a home test is considered a suspect. Am I correct? We put it in a different category um, only because um, there's a lot of variables in, in home tests, but um, we still consider it in um, our contact tracing and our case investigations. All right. The next question comes from Kathy. She asks, is the booster a smaller dose? 
the booster for Moderna might be. I, I've been hearing that. Yeah, it'll be half the dose. At least that's what was submitted. But again, this information has not been finalized. So I don't want to speak to that and then have to change my mind later. So it might be, yes, but I don't know for sure. All right, the next question comes from Linda. How many in St. Clair County are currently in the hospital with COVID? Currently hospitalized, we know. About 30 people. Okay, the next question is also about hospitals and this comes from Kathy. She asks, are our hospitals full in St. Clair County? What's our hospital capacity? Do we know what our hospital capacity is? Okay. So about 75 to 80% filled, which is pretty typical. Um, remember that it, during flu season in the winter months, we generally have fuller capacity as well. Another uh, reason why we're concerned about, uh, you know, that d layering of, of uh, flu and, and ongoing COVID. Um, but again, I'll say our hospitals with these last couple of surges did a really great job on um, adjusting uh, their beds. Um, they have the ability to kind of add more beds and accommodate, um, you know, a greater census. So I'm pretty sure our hospitals will, will keep up. That's not really the problem, how full a hospital it is. It, it's really about how exhausted the staff is, resources uh, for materials, how many ventilators we have, whether or not you can even transfer people when they're acutely ill. Um, if every hospital is at 80 to 90 percent capacity, transfers become a lot more problematic. So there's a lot more variables than just our hospital beds and whether or not they're full. All right, the next question comes from, I apologize as I'm saying your name wrong, Mar Martina, Martin, Martin, sorry. Um, approximately how many days behind is the health department when it comes to contact tracing school outbreaks? Days behind. God, some of them we're not gonna get to at all. Uh, we're getting anywhere, as I mentioned, 70 to 100 cases a day. Uh, those cases are typically sent up to Trace Force or another system we call PEG, where you get a text. These are uh, state support systems. And we are selecting out cases that are associated with outbreaks, um, congregate settings like nursing homes, or some of these suspect cases, like we said, home, home positive tests, where we really just need to get it a little bit more information to find out if, you know, there's, there's um, potential opportunities there to to reduce spread. So I would say there's a very good chance you're not going to get a, a call. You might get a text or, or a call from the state, but you may not hear from one of my staff um, at all. And Doc, this which is, is for school is, outbreaks. Well, school outbreaks we get involved with, uh, but again, we probably can't contact every single individual that's been, and we know we're not contacting the individuals who are exposed. Um, so this is why it's important for everyone to know what to do, right? We've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, it's very clear what you should be doing if you are sick and test positive, or even if you're not sick and test positive, it's very clear what you should do if you're exposed. And if you can't do the quarantine thing, at the very least, avoid being around high-risk individuals. And we would strongly recommend serial testing if you're not going to um, stay away from people. At least do the serial testing to uh, make sure that you're not um, asymptomatically shedding the virus. Okay, the next question is from Carrie. Uh, Fort Gratiot Middle School has had a case almost daily. Is there a certain amount of cases that would lead to virtual schooling? It's a great question, Carrie, and I would say no, there's no magic number. Um, it really comes down to whether or not the school feels that it is transmitted within the school or whether the cases are are. Um, developing because of outside school exposures. If there is a feeling like the school building, the classroom itself is the source of contagious, uh, is the source of transmission from student to student or student to staff or whatever, then there is the discussion of increasing your mitigation strategies. I use that word a lot, but I showed you that slide, right? I slowed you the slide where if you wear a mask, you're a lot less likely to have cases. So what we're encouraging schools to do is that if you're having multiple cases that keep kind of 
um, to strengthen to strengthen that mitigation strategy. Um, have kids wear masks. Request testing. Um, make sure your kids are staying further apart. Um, try and avoid the whole uh, lunchroom thing where they're taking their masks off and they're in each other's faces. Uh, these things can be added selectively to places that are having problems. And then if that fails and we're just getting um, a tremendous amount of development of cases, uh, then we have that discussion with the schools um, to take a pause. And we, we've had those discussions um, with all of our schools, to be honest with you. And it's, a, it's an individual case-by-case -case decision. All right. The next question comes from Stephanie. What will be done with the lack of healthcare workers leaving because they don't want to get vaccinated and they're being told they have to um, places to stay to be employed? Does the county have a plan to help? No. Uh, this is a nationwide issue. Um, I don't know how to answer that question. I think uh, I think it's a little short-sighted to say healthcare workers are leaving because they don't want to get vaccinated. Healthcare workers are leaving, period, uh, because of the stress and the the hours and the, the lack of support for many reasons. Um, we have a health we had a healthcare shortage before the pandemic and now um i think it's being acutely felt uh this is a it's a huge problem it's a huge issue and and no because we we can't get mutual aid from another county which kind of was the emergency preparedness plans right is mutual aid contracts etc and we can't do that because our our neighboring counties are having the same problems we are um so um it's a difficult issue. I think the solution, in my mind, is to prevent people from getting sick and going to the hospital in the first place. If we know that vaccines can, in fact, markedly reduce hospitalizations, it would make a lot of sense for us to really focus on that. And as a health department that really focuses on prevention, I, I think that would be one of our plans is to try and reduce the amount of hospitalizations needed in the first place. But once we're there, um, we're going to have to just wing it, I think. And that would be actually be a better question for our hospitals. Um, I'm not in the weeds with them, and I'm sure each one of them has a contingency plan um, to respond to this. Okay, it's 412, and we have several questions, but we'll get to as many as we can in the next couple minutes. Um, this is from Katie. When will the school say it's time for the mask to be back on? I don't know. I, I, I would hope they would have done it already. Um, but as you know, we have we have a, a kind of a, a war going on with some of that. And um, people want to make their own choices. So I think each school is going to have to come to that decision independently. All right. Carissa asks, what is the difference between RSV and COVID-19? Do they do they have the same thing, symptoms? And I've heard that they are the same thing. No, they're not the same thing. RSV is respiratory syncytial virus and COVID is, is coronavirus, right? So SARS-CoV-2. Um, there are literally thousands of viruses that cause disease. And there are hundreds and hundreds of respiratory viruses that circulate every year. Um, there's adenovirus and Coxsackie virus. I mean, there's just hundreds of viruses. Um, it's a complex field to say that. And they're all different. They all attach to different cells. They all create different cellular responses. They all have different incub incubation periods. Um, however, their symptoms can be very similar, right? Fever, headache, cough, congestion. I mean, that's the problem. Our bodies really, when, when our bodies get sick, there's really a kind of a handful of things our bodies do when we try and fight off an infection. And when our bodies fight off viral infections, it tends to feel the same way for us, um, the body aches and the symptoms we have. Remember, those symptoms are being caused by our immune system, our bodies fighting off this invasion. Um, not so much for the invasion itself, but from our bodies fighting it off, which is why the symptoms are so similar, right? When we cough, it's to try and get rid of this crap out of our lungs. And so you'll cough for all kinds of things, including infections, um, anything that your body is trying to expel. And that's just one example. So a cough can be a symptom of hundreds of things. 
I don't know if that answers your question, but no, they're absolutely not the same thing. It's not the same as the influenza virus either. They're all different viruses. Okay, this is from Janine. She asked, my two children have COVID. If they are isolating in their rooms, am I clear of quarantine after their 10 to 14 days? So you should quarantine the 10, well, you know, your ideal quarantine time is 14 days, but we say 10 days or seven days with a test out. But your quarantine begins on the last day of their potential infectious period. And I'm assuming as their mother, you're taking care of them and you're in the same household. So your quarantine will actually start on the last day of their isolation period, which is the 10 days from the onset of their symptoms. Really is kind of a, a, a pain, but that is really the way it goes. Because you could, they could be potentially shedding their virus up until day 10. And then that would be your last potential exposure date. So then you would do your quarantine from that day forward. Okay. Uh, it's 4.15, Doc. There's, I see two more questions. Do you want to just finish these? or? Yeah, just finish them up. And thank you guys okay. for sending your questions and They're all great questions. And if we miss you, please send them to COVID19 at stclaircounty.org. Um, and we'll answer them through that um, mechanism. Okay, the next one is from Melinda. Schools are getting their own waves. Some clinics in this area say a week or two of virtual would help schools. I'm aware some parents fight this, but how bad do schools have to get before a week or two of virtual? Some other schools in different counties have done that. Yeah, we've, I've answered this question a few times today, and I know it, this is a ch really challenging question. And I'll just say that we're making those decisions. We're encouraging those schools on a case-by-case -case situation. Um, we've got a handful of outbreaks that don't seem to be going away. They're just kind of, they, they've calmed down, but the cases keep coming in. And our, our staff was talking today that we just really need to have another sit down and see where we can go. Um, it's, I can't answer that question. Um, I can say, though, that the schools that have paused and brought kids and staff back with masks seem to have avoided further outbreaks and cases, at least so far, knock on wood. So I do believe that that approach is valid and worth considering. Okay, Barbara asks, are positive cases for Woodlands included in statistics? Sure. Positive cases anywhere are included in our statistics, and we follow Woodlands um, schools along with all of our other schools. Woodlands is unique. Of course, it has a highly vulnerable population, and they have, right from the get-go, hats off to their staff, have provided, I think, an exemplary um, approach to um really trying to reduce transmission that that schools uh, really gone above and beyond what all the other schools have been doing and all our schools are trying but woodlands has really done a great job all right and the last question and then the rest we're just going to um, have to have you send those to the covid19 email but from Lori, is the michigan covid alert exposure app on my iphone really tracking my covid exposures oh that's a great question you know what i didn't Brandon, do you know anything about Michigan COVID alert? Is it working? It only works as good as people use it. I can tell you this. So if you've used it and nobody else has put in their exposures, it's probably only as good as like one iteration. The more people that use it, the more effective it will be. And they're starting to use it more and more. I honestly, I think apps like this are great because people can take this information into their own hands and really utilize it instead of waiting for us or somebody to call them and tell them what to do. Um, the problem is um, it's only as good as your weakest link. So if you have a bunch of people who aren't bothering, um, you're going to have half that information is going to be missing, which is the problem that we're having, right? More than half the people don't even answer our calls or even respond to us. So um, that just limits how effective it is, but it's probably doing better than not doing anything at all. Okay. And the very, very, I promise, last question is from um, Jody. I don't understand how a student can test positive, but his or her brother can still attend school because they don't have symptoms. Well, that shouldn't be happening. So if there's an individual in a household that's positive, uh, that household in general should be quarantining. So what's happening is that individual is being sent to school um, despite our recommendations to be quarantined in, instead. Um, now, it is possible to have 
you know, 10 people in a household, two people get sick and the rest of the people not get sick. I mean, viruses aren't, are, aren't 100% infectious. That's just kind of the nature of infections. It's not, it's not guaranteed everyone's going to get sick um, after an exposure. But household exposures are one of your highest risk exposures, right? As everybody's together, they're eating together, they're talking together, there's repeated exposures. So in a household, we strongly recommend exposures to quarantine per our guidelines. All right. And Doc, um, Pam from earlier, she did post a few links that we will take a look at. We'll take a look at that, Pam, and see where it comes from. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Okay.